How's it going, my man? <laughs> Good, man. Let me sort this out here. No worries, buddy. How's the lighting? Bad. It's Beauty. looking great, man. Great. No, no. I was putting the kids to sleep, and I um, fell asleep with them. So. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, <okay. laughs> a little nap. Oh, that's cool, bud. So, yeah, you guys are still 13 hours ahead of us now. It's looking crazy, bud. Yeah, so um, it's um, 8, p- 8 p.m. Friday night right now. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Well, well, bud, thanks for yeah taking up your Friday night. I normally go on the workshop and uh, and yeah make my make my jewelry and stuff from. Oh, geez, probably about oh, like I said, about now when the kids go to sleep, so about seven, eight till about two, three in the morning sometimes. Wow, so, man. Yeah. And then- I remember, I remember when I was traveling in New Zealand, bud, like. Wi-Fi was flipping mission there. Like it was, yeah, it was like so, so bad. And like everywhere you had to pay for it as well. Didn't like if you went to hotels or hostels or whatever, it was like, yeah, no, that's another 20 bucks a day. You're like, what? Yeah, no, it's ridiculous. And like, if I, um, if I talked even like my, when I, when I would talk to my grandparents and stuff, yeah. theirs would be like so much faster. And it's like, they probably have the slowest, slowest <laughs> Yeah, of course. It's still a bit, um, still a bit backwards here in New Zealand. Yeah, I, I saw that thing on one of your posts about the the bacon smell. Like, oh yeah, yeah, the bacon. I'm like, candy. oh my god, I want to, I really want to smell that. <laughs> Does it I'll smell talk. like bacon? Uh yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it's um, it's actual bacon grease that I use in it. Oh wow! So, so I take like the bacon grease and um, yeah, put it with the soy wax and then. No ways. Yeah, yeah. Put it, uh, yeah kind of mix it all together and then <laughs> let it cool back down. And then you got a bacon smelling candle. So I, I sell that at the market um, when I go and you get people that are, um, they'll be like smelling them. They'll kind of, and they'll like tell their friend, the friend to be like, Oh, this, like, oh it's, not, it's not that bad. And they're like, Oh, she's a vegetarian or something. Ah, yes, oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> or a vegan. A vegan. All right. Cool. All right. But well, uh, good evening there, Mr. Alex Moore from Cromwell, New Zealand. It's uh, epic to see your face again, buddy. It's been a while. <laughs> Thank yeah, you so man. much for yeah, joining us. Too, man. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us today on the Ridiculous Demon Podcast, bud. Oh, thanks That's, for having me. Yeah, pleasure, man. So, so I just want to like, I guess, start off with like you and I met uh, on an Aussie rules field uh, in London, in North London, many, many years ago. And uh, I think it was on, in Regent's Park, actually, if uh, my memory is correct. Uh, yeah. My memory is not that great. But uh, <laughs> I just, yeah, we met like in the, like a quarter time huddle from, from what I recall. And uh, yeah, just instantly, like, I was like, this bloke is a good bloke. So, um, you know, now it's, it's, it was not amazing, like couple years that we spent together. And it's great to now be speaking to you here. So thanks for joining us again. Um, oh, thank you. Pleasure, bud. So, but let's kick off, man. Like you have a super interesting story. It's definitely unique. You've tried a lot of things, um, but we like to go back to kind of where it all started. And, you know, you mentioned that you grew up in a town of like 25,000 people and you lived on an awesome street. You're still best mates with a couple of your buddies from that street. So maybe you can just take us back to, you know, where life began and started. Um, yeah. So, um, so I grew up in a town called Collinsville, Illinois, which is actually um, a suburb of St. Louis, Missouri, um, right in the middle of the states. So um, basically, there's just the Mississippi River that kind of cuts the Missouri and Illinois as a as a border there, and it was just on the east side in, in Illinois where I grew up. Um, and yeah, like I said, it was a Helen Place was the the name of the street. So yeah, just a kind of a leafy, leafy road with, um, yeah, it's probably, oh, geez, dozen or so kids living on the street, um, three or four, like my same, like within, you know, my same age and everything. Um, and yeah, from, from the time I moved there when I was, I think five or six years old, um, yeah, I met my best friend, uh, Skippy. Uh, so he, <laughs> so yeah. Ronald, Ronald's his real name, but he has nickname always growing up is Skippy. Um, and, uh, and then Wayne. So they were my two best friends and a few other friends that kind of came and came and went, but yeah, we were the main three that kind of hung around there. Um, yeah. And like I said, still, still really good friends today. Wayne's living in Portland, Oregon, Skip's still in 
in the same area. So, but yeah, hopefully they'll both make it here one day and, <laughs> and visit as well. But yeah, no, it's, it's good to yeah look back and reminisce about those days. Cause it was, yeah, truly like, um, yeah, it was like a movie almost. And you see like the movies of like growing up on these kind of streets in America yeah. and yeah, that's, that's the way it was, you know, just running around playing games in the street, playing baseball and oh, basketball, running in the woods, exploring. There's, yeah, it was awesome. So that's yeah, so really cool. lucky where I grew that's up. Amazing. And, and so I'm, it was like yeah. safe and like, you know, like it, there was no worry. Like your folks were like, you know, be in by a certain time, but just go and have fun kind of thing. Pretty much. Yeah. We just like, I was pretty, um, pretty lucky that way with my parents. Like they, kind of gave gave my brother and I freedom to kind of yeah do what we wanted and like we never I, I talked to my mom when she was here and she was she's kind of like oh you know why why didn't, why were you guys so good you know when kids and I think it's just because I told her that you know we we were lucky to be able to do things and we didn't want to blow it you know and go out and like get arrested and break shit like that yeah, you know yeah. and and do stupid stuff like kids do. we did do some stupid stuff but you know nothing too major where you know we um yeah, got those privileges taken away, I guess. Nice. But yeah, it's basically, yeah, just um, lots. I think during school, school times, it's like, I'll be, be home when the street lights came on. Yeah. <laughs> and then in the summer times, it's just, yeah, kind of whenever. And you just kind of roam from house to house. Nobody locked the doors, anything. You just, cause you know, if, if I was going to my friend's place, I just walk right into their house and they do the same. And <laughs> yeah. So yeah, no, really safe. You don't have to worry really about much. And yeah, could get most places on your bike. And yeah, so it was cool. awesome. I was always jealous, man. Like I used to remember watching that on TV and uh, I was like, wow, I wish we had that in South Africa. <laughs> it was like so cool. <laughs> did, you ever, did you ever see the movie, uh, The Sandlot? No, I don't recall okay. it. Um, so that's, I think that takes pics back in like the 60s, but it's pretty similar with that, like very similar type of things, like just playing baseball in the summer, all summer. So cool. Uh, going to the swimming pool, you know, causing trouble with the life, the older, like, let girl lifeguards at the swimming pool and stuff like that so yeah that no, was um definitely an awesome time you know what's really funny is like you know even as two south africans we there's some kind of identity you know we can sort of identify with what you're saying because like so much of the tv and like culture you when you're a kid was just it's all american so you, mm -hmm. you almost like um can picture exactly what you mean even though we might not have lived there which is yeah, it, it sounds pretty idyllic, I must say. Yeah, yeah. You did choose uh, a long way away from the States to be living now, so your, your mates have, to have a long way to come visit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, my, like I said, my best friend, Skip, he, um, he, he works for a chemical company. And basically, his key describes his chemical company as kind of like the Amazon of like science, science companies. <laughs> so he travels quite a bit to, um, to India, and um, uh, he goes to Europe and, and China quite a bit so he's he's racking up his frequent flyer miles to to bring the family down here so i think he's actually pretty close i think it's about a hundred thousand per person to come from the from st louis so he's i think he's pretty close for enough for all of them so yeah that'd wow. be awesome when when he could come sweet yeah so, yeah and you mentioned your folks um a little, you know giving you some freedom to roam and stuff tell us maybe a little bit more about them so your dad was uh well he, he worked for boeing for 45 years and your your mum uh, worked uh, for a university yep. so they kind of always encourage you to travel and, and try new things yeah so um yeah like i said yeah, my dad's well my dad still works for boeing so he's still not retired yet so he's over 45 years so he's, he's i think since he was about 18 19 he started off as a just like as a grass cutter and then has worked his way up through as a machinist and now he kind of works in a thing called the the tool crib where he kind of keeps the specialized tools and the people someone needs them they come and get them and then yeah but anyway yeah no my um my mom yeah she works for a, a school district in the st louis area now and before she worked at a, a st louis university where i eventually graduated from but i think um yeah just they're they're never really too too strict as far as letting us do things like that and it's not like that they weren't around they didn't care they just kind of i guess trusted us to you know trust that we were going to do the do the right thing and yeah always encouraged me to kind of I think one, one time she told me was, um, you know, you can always come back, you can always come home, mm. you know, and um, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of stuck with me. And I think now that, now that she has grandkids that are here, um, yeah, I think she's probably regret saying that a little bit because um, we're so <laughs> far away, but, uh, um, but yeah, now she's been here a couple of times, which has been awesome. And um, yeah, we're, we're hopefully going back there in September uh, for a few weeks to visit again. So um, 
Yeah, yeah no, she's they've always been really encouraging of the of the travel and doing things away and you know going away for nice. you know, different trips and things. And we we did a bit of traveling when I was a kid. Uh, my dad's dad, um, he was a professor and worked for different universities in like the South Pacific. So he, he lived in Samoa for quite a bit, um, or American Samoa, I mean. Um, and also they lived in Hawaii for about oh, 20, 25 years. So we visited them in Hawaii when I was a kid. Um, and then now he lives in Seattle. And then my grandma, she lived in San Francisco. So we visited her quite a bit. And then his other family vacations around the States and things. So yeah, yeah we've always traveled quite a bit when I was younger. And um, yeah, it just kind of, I guess, fueled my fuel for or fueled my desire for travel you know so yeah he's definitely done done a fair bit now that that's for sure and i can't believe yeah, your dad yeah. worked for his worked for 45 years in the company yeah. that's super yeah. impressive wow. and that's amazing um <laughs> but also i think you know i've mentioned this before like at some point we've chatted about it like st louis is it's actually a really um sort of i don't know i don't know what the word is exactly but there's a lot of people that are sort of like of high sort of stature should we say that sort of originate from there you know you have guys like lewis house and then i mean lots of other people i can't even remember the name you know all the names now but what what is it like and why is it like that in st louis um, yeah i don't know really yeah no there are you do get quite a few people from there and i guess it's just a i don't know a big city in the middle of the states really where they're you know it's kind of right in like the the bread basket of the states so if you know, if you maybe want to go to the city from these smaller places outside, you head to St. Louis, maybe. Okay. I don't know. Um, yeah, no, because it was funny because I know that Lewis Howes, um, he played he played basketball in high school. And I knew he's – and I remember hearing him on his podcast. And he's only a couple years younger than uh-huh. I am. So, um, yeah, and the high school I went to, I went to a small high school as well. Um, we actually played, played basketball against them. So, I mm-hmm. wouldn't have known it then, but it would have been Jay's – uh, 20 years ago that I would have played basketball <laughs> against them in, in high school. So yeah, that was pretty cool. That's cool, um, man. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So yeah, he's, so do you, do you listen to this podcast um, but, a bit but, or anything? I, we, but, we have. Yeah. For sure. I, we actually started, that's how, that was one of the, not one of the first, but like, I, I really <laughs> love his podcasts. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, he speaks to amazing people and he's like really blown up. So um, but actually, like I guess I don't listen to him much that anymore. But um, but he's obviously the same with me. I, I listen to a lot. And now it's there's so many podcasts yeah. on my list that it's like, that's it. Yeah, exactly. and and actually, I, I'd been I was going to go to a mastermind in Puerto Rico, I think two years ago now, and I actually got a sign two two of his books signed. Um, and then there was the the hurricane came through with the and it, it ruined. So I never ended up going to the. Oh no! It, it ruined the whole mastermind that we were going to go to. And but I've still got his signed books, which is. Oh, pretty that's cool. cool. That's yeah. pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> and but you mentioned so you played basketball in high school, and but you're also interested in like arts and ceramics and things, and it's kind of amazing how things come around, like you know, three six. Yeah, well, I think um, oh, oh, like all through growing, I mean, growing up. I was always really into, I wouldn't say really into it, but I always enjoyed like kind of drawing and, and sketching and things like that. And I remember like, yeah, my mom would enroll me in like these, these drawing classes and things and just to keep us busy, you know, probably to get us away from her, um, you know, out of her <laughs> hair on weekends or something, you know? So we we're always doing like sports or some type of class like that. Um, yeah. I remember, do remember like, it was like, and I probably was really young and I remember drawing like, you know, like sketches of like hands and things like just real technical stuff. And wow. I wasn't really into it. I like drawing kind of like army scenes and things like that, you know? And, um, okay. yeah. So, um, through high school, I was like, I think I mentioned on that sheet that I was a bit of a, bit of a class clown too. And, um, <laughs> it was, they were kind of just like blow off classes, but I actually really enjoyed them. Yeah. Like the painting and art and, um, yeah, sculpting and poet, uh, pottery and yeah. all that stuff. So, yeah, no, I love that. Um, through high school and I guess it kind of yeah I never really knew I was into it more than just kind of drawing for fun and kind of goofing around and stuff so yeah um, yeah and then and then other sports and things I did but uh, yeah no the, those are always really and still still remember I still have some, some of the pieces actually my family at home has some of my pottery and things that I <laughs> that I made so that's awesome Matt. and but when when did like rugby come into the picture for you was that in high school no so that was um so I worked at a summer camp. So, um, so you probably have heard about like Camp America. I, I did Camp America. 
Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so yeah, so I worked at a summer camp in, in Ver- uh, Harrisonburg, Virginia called Camp Horizons. And obviously, as you know, a lot of the staff are just from all over the place. Mm. And yeah, um, I knew I'd, I, and that was kind of a few years in, into university. So probably after my second or third year of university. And I don't actually remember hearing about rugby before my first year because I went to school out in California and um, some of the guys I knew played rugby. And I remember like the one guy had his first t-shirt that he wore um, on his, like pinned up on his wall, like to the first practice and just like covered in blood. And I was just <laughs> like, oh man, what is, what is this? And, and um, yeah, so then uh, anyway, so I played a bit all just like passing around and, and playing at the, at the summer camp with some of the other guys. It was, um, yeah, Aussies and, and Kiwis and there's some South Africans too and English guys. And yeah, so we played it a bit there. And then when I came back to St. Louis and I, um, yeah, found like a local team and yeah, just signed up and started playing, playing with them. So That's... yeah, it actually came, came pretty naturally, um, to me in a certain extent because I never played American football or anything uh-huh. like that. I was always just tall and lanky. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, I played basketball. And um, so they put me in as a, as a lock. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that, straight in the lock that's mm. so classic that that you said because that just brought a memory back i remember when i was at i was at camp um there was like this one american guy like he knew like a bit about rugby but he mostly knew about the, the kiwis and stuff and um mm. and i had some mates actually from the aussie rules club but before you joined um actually one of them was uh, zeus's best mate uh, this guy boxy and uh, he, I mean, he, everyone loved to booze a lot and, and they would, <laughs> they would call me right when they were like really, really hammered and, you know, at the camp, but you, there was only one telephone back then, you know, it's not like people had cell phones and stuff. Yeah. And, um, they rang one night and there's one, and this guy answered this guy that really liked rugby and they were like, Hey, we're wondering if Gareth is there. And he's like, no, no, Gareth's actually out and what, and whatnot. Um, and they said, well, can you just let um, him know that uh, Sean Fitzpatrick rang and um <laughs> and that uh, yeah like we we just want to talk to him about playing rugby and stuff um and sean fitzpatrick's obviously one of the greatest like <laughs> captains ever of new zealand rugby oh, yeah. and uh, and ever since then but like, these guys just thought i was like this crazy rugby player and stuff yeah. and i was like thanks boys i appreciate that call and <laughs> uh, so funny yeah, that's awesome. he was like yeah, then- oh, gareth sean Pitts." Sean Fitzpatrick rang for you and I'm like oh okay cool that's good to know yeah they were they were wondering to speak to me I remember that <laughs> uh, so it's funny. Okay. yeah so um oh yeah sorry go ahead no, no, oh yeah so and um so yeah so I learned there I started playing for for a few years and that's when I um yeah started started teaching then full time uh-huh. and I'd come into like school with like um yeah black eyes or like limping or you know things like that broken broken fingers and i still have my yeah my, see that finger oh, there wow. doesn't, straighten, oh, doesn't nice. straighten yeah that was actually in london but um yeah just a few fingers like that and the, the principal would just look at me and be like who oh, was wrong with this guy you know and <laughs> i know what i really understood and then um right before i moved to the uk i took like a uh, a little um maternity cover teaching um, high school chemistry so like level two high school chemistry and when they asked me to do it I told them I was like I don't think I've even taken this high of chemistry and they said oh that's all right we've heard <laughs> we've heard you're, we've heard you're good with behavior management with the kids so but it was yeah it was really good I, I think I learned just as much as the kids but I'd show them some videos and it wasn't actually it wasn't rugby union videos it was some um, like rugby league biggest tackles kind of thing and, uh, and they watched that and the kids are like this guy's crazy if he plays that so yeah they were just like the straight the straightest kids you know straightest place after that just yeah on best behavior thought i was like a crazy guy and um yeah, awesome. didn't know what to expect so yeah it was an aw- that was an awesome little thing and then obviously yeah moved over to to east london to to play cool man <laughs> i can just imagine them just looking at this tour with this big guy like talking about these massive hits and they're like, okay, well, let's get back to class. Anyone want to misbehave? You're like, <laughs> and you've already got like a blue eye and a freaking yeah. <laughs> scratches all over. And- yeah. Classic. And so, so eventually um, you actually moved to California to study and, um, uh, and you actually had some really like cool and interesting jobs there. Maybe uh-huh, yeah, yeah, tell yeah. us um, a little bit more about. Yeah. So um, I think, uh, 
well, I think, like I said, I was a bit of a class clown in, in high school. And when I was kind of choosing universities, I wanted to pick somewhere where I could get away and kind of start over because I kind of had gotten to a, such a, a class con reputation that I was never like taken really seriously about anything. Mm-hmm. About anything. Um, so yeah, so I, I wanted, to, and, and plus I, I loved it out in California. I had a friend who moved out there the year before and I'd been out to visit and thought it'd be pretty, pretty cool to go to the university there, get out of just the boring flat Midwest. And um, yeah, so I went to Cal State Long Beach, which is kind of about... Oh, uh, a little closer to LA, but kind of between um, San Diego and LA, um, kind of location wise. Um, yeah, so I went out there as just a general studies kind of liberal arts major, not knowing what I was going to do. Took some some pretty fun classes. Sports appreciation um, was one. Another one was um, intro to oceanography. And that one was really awesome. Um, and also an intro to acting class, so which was which was really cool. It was like, um, yeah, sister of this Hollywood Hollywood um, director that had was teaching it. So that was really good. And those all, like I said, all university classes. Um, and I also, so while I was there, I worked for um, the campus kind of patrol, campus security, campus police. I don't know what really. I can't remember the exact <laughs> title. Community service, you know, officer type thing. Um, or basically, it was you just work nights and. If, if like when the night class is finished, you'd get calls from these girls who you'd go and either like if you either walk them or pick them up in like a little golf cart and take them either back home, <laughs> drop them off, make sure they arrive safe at their house or back to their car and then they'd be on their way and, and that was it. So yeah, that was a pretty fun job. And, um, and also all through high school, my, my favorite band was Sublime. So you guys probably heard of them in, yeah, in yeah. South Africa. Cool. And um, so yeah, so I... Um, kind of got a hold of them when I was out there because their their record label called Skunk Records was based in um based in Long Beach. So yeah, got a hold of them, went in for an interview and they're like, oh yep, we're looking for an intern if you want to do it. And they okay. yeah, it was awesome. So I was like, yes, I'm sold. I'm in. So yeah, I worked for them when I was there. Um and so basically the lead singer for Sublime had um passed away so uh, about three years before. And so the remaining members of the band started a new band called the Long Beach Dub All Stars, and so basically that was right when they were getting big. And yeah, it was basically kind of um, like I said, like an intern with the record label. So I go on tour with them. Um, yeah, go to the shows, and because I was only eighteen, a lot of the shows were twenty-one and over. So I get into the shows. They just let me carry their gear in the back door, and then I'd be in the show. You know, then <laughs> um, staying backstage and. Selling, selling stuff at their merch booth. But then, um, yeah, when we went on tours and things, we went on a couple tours. Um, yeah, it was basically just doing the same stuff, helping at their booths and, yeah, getting to hang out and hang out backstage when they when they were playing and stuff. And, yeah, no, that was really that was really cool for, like, an 18-year-old kid from, <laughs> from, yeah. uh, from the Midwest to be, you know, <laughs> on stage with, us, like, my favorite favorite band, wow. basically, you know, was was pretty awesome. Jesus. So, uh, yeah, so I did. Um, I did. I actually worked for a few record labels um, uh, as kind of a similar type of thing. Like that was kind of before kind of social media. So promo work was all done kind of all by hand. You know, you had mm-hmm. to send posters out to record shops and things like that. So I did a lot of that, and then go to music festivals and have a booth. And um, yeah, so I got to see a lot of a lot of cool bands, meet a lot of cool bands like that. Um, like one was, I think it was probably, oh, I can't remember what year it was, but it was the Vans Warped Tour. Mm-hmm. So um, it's just a, a kind of a tour that goes around all over the states, and it's kind of like a skate and skate and punk rock kind of tour. But um, yeah, just tons of cool bands on it. And yeah, one year they had Eminem. On, cool. um, on the tour so wow. yeah I was back I was there with my, my, my brother and um, we were backstage and you know Eminem comes out of his trailer and he's about Timmy Lowry size so it's, um, <laughs> no way you know, it's, yeah so he's tiny yeah so <laughs> if I get nobody else knows Tim Lowry but um, I got, what would you say about oh, five eight or something like that five nine <laughs> just uh, not the biggest guy but um, for, for someone yeah, like Eminem you think oh man he's uh He's a lot smaller than I thought in person, but he's with these huge like bodyguards. And um, I go, oh, we're going to play some basketball. Do you want to play? And I was like, 
yeah that'd be awesome no way. Yeah. And then my brother's like oh i don't know he should you know and um so he's like i'm gonna get dressed and and so he went back in in his trailer and me and my brother are waiting there with like a couple of bodyguards just standing there kind of like well, twiddling our thumbs you know and um wow we're waiting there about 10 15 minutes and then another bodyguard comes back out and he goes oh i decided he doesn't want to play anymore so i was like no oh, no. <laughs> what a disappointment oh, yeah i know like but yeah it's so my. funny because my brother was just like oh you know and you you would have fouled him and like hurt him or something <laughs> <laughs> canceled the tour and stuff so yeah that was one um one band that was horrible um one one singer i guess rapper another was um blink 182 so yeah, yeah. Hung out with those guys and wow um, yeah on their stage and yeah met all them and yeah hung That's out with so them cool bit. so yeah and i was yeah. like i said it was like a it was like a dream come true for a you know 18 19 yeah. year old kid that, that's it into, epic, into punk rock and, and stuff so yeah. Yeah. Sublime yeah. was pretty big in south africa man it was a, a massive like there was a lot of my friends listened like were big into Sublime. one of my best friends gareth another gareth he's like he would just be just he'd just have another hour conversation to you now about sublime like yeah just uh, people that were sublime like big sublime fans were like proper fans that's <laughs> great yep you're right and still you still people you get still people probably even you know that are our age now that are um still like huge into them and i don't listen Amazing. too much anymore but when i put it on like you still know every single so word and um <laughs> yeah then you just want to keep listening and listening and listening and yeah no so that was that was awesome and oh. and actually like when i was over in the uk the UK, they didn't really get huge in the uk but like being down at, probably in australia and new zealand they were they were quite big i think here too so yeah most people here know them as yeah, well you still yeah. see people like with like sublime t-shirts on yeah like, around new zealand you're like oh yeah <laughs> Crazy. yeah, yeah. That, so, yeah that was that, those are, that was kind of the start of my um of my crazy crazy jobs that i've had in my life yeah. so <laughs> yeah and but talking about like like crazy jobs and cool jobs and stuff you you also mentioned you got into acting school and yeah you know you've actually been in some really cool films too so maybe yeah. you can just tell it those have obviously been over like your whole sort of life and career mm -hmm. but maybe you can tell us a little bit about those films what you've been in and how that was for you yeah so um when i was in california still um so i, I was in california for school for just about a year i stayed and i transferred back to st louis university which is closer to home and um, so I was in one film. Um, so I first got in, my first film that I was in was called Little Nicky with Adam Sandler, oh, cool. which was another, which was, oh, it wasn't the greatest movie, but it was just because <laughs> I was a huge Adam Sandler fan as well. So <laughs> like the, yeah, Billy Madison and comedies like that. Um, so yeah, being in that was, was pretty sweet. And then um, oh, I had just like a little no line part in, I think it was, was it Princess Diaries. Um, nice. <laughs> which that was uh, yeah from ages ago, and then I moved back home, and there wasn't really much going on in the 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 way of acting and movies being made in in St. Louis. Um, so yeah, I just kind of put that kind of well, hobby, I guess, on the back burner until I moved over to London, and then yeah, got back into it in London. Um, did quite a bit of like kind of background artist stuff, extra stuff. Um, and then yeah just did tons of auditions and got some parts missed out on some but the thing is over there a lot of the american films big budget american films are filmed over there i don't know if it's, if it's because of tax purposes or or things like that but they're always looking for americans over there so i had that kind of um had think that going for me when when I was over there. So the biggest one that I was in was uh, one with Matt Damon called Green Zone. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a yeah speaking line, actually speaking to Matt Damon a couple times, um, which was pretty cool. Yeah, That's so cool, yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> um, and that was that was directed by Paul Greengrass, who was yeah it just reminded me yeah because I, I listened just the other day to your podcast with was it Donovan Donovan Marsh. Marsh. Yeah. Marsh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, the that was really yeah, kind of brought back some memories of the yeah. whole movie <laughs> industry and stuff. So, um, but but yeah, besides those, uh, what's some other ones? Um, Captain America, I was in. I was one of the one of the Hydras, which is like one of the kind of the, the enemy soldiers <laughs> in Captain America, the first Captain America. Um, oh, jeez, 
the Dark, Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, so I was in a scene. I was a bad guy. I played a lot of bad guys for some reason. Um, <laughs> so I was a bad guy, um, a villain, one of um, one of like the henchmen, and um, it was in a scene where all the bankers and things get um, kidnapped. And yeah, so that was in a scene with uh, Morgan Freeman was in that scene wow. and Christian Bale. So yeah, that was, wow. that was cool being being there. Even though I think like where, where they put me, I was kind of upstairs on this kind of balcony in this in this bank, and I w- don't think I got much film time. So, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> so- it, was, it was cool being being on the set and stuff for that. Um, and then another one was pretty pretty good. Was I got um, killed by I was killed by. Um, Sir Anthony Hopkins. So I got, wow. was on a, that was on like a military transport plane. He was a prisoner and he breaks out and he like spills this little capsule of poison in it. Yeah. You're all, all the guys <laughs> choking to death and fo- they give you this stuff, makes your mouth foam all up. So you're wow. up with foam. And yeah, no, he was, he was an awesome guy too. Cause all these big, like Matt Damon and Anthony Hopkins were two of the biggest, like biggest stars like out there and the two of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. Wow. You know, like, yeah, you wouldn't think that they're, you know, totally A-list celebrities, you know, just the way they act towards, you know, the little people like, like yeah. us in the, in the, on the sets and things. Yeah. So yeah, Anthony Hopkins was posing for photos wow. with us. And um, yeah, same with Matt Damon, he was getting photos with us and yeah, it was, was just, yeah, super nice guys. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of good experiences doing that over there in, in London. Wow. <laughs> cool, I, I always have a laugh. Like I, whenever I watch a movie, I think, you know, have a moment of thinking like someone's sitting there going, that's me. That's me in the corner. There. That's, yeah. me. that's me. Like, and th- yeah. and that's, that's like, you're going to be showing your kids or you already have, I'm sure. Like that's dad over there. The yeah. <laughs> the, um, I kept one of the scenes in Captain America. I was a dead Hydra. So basically I was just let you like laying on the floor. So I was like, Oh yeah. See that guy laying there. That's me. You know? <laughs> Ooh, man. That's that's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> so, um, so Alex is moving forward. You, you mentioned UK now. And um, so you ended up in the UK, as you said, and, uh, and you took sort of taking rugby a bit more seriously there. Mm. Um, how did that sort of end up going for you? Um, yeah. So when I first went over there, I went and played for team, in East London, uh, Essex kind of border uh, called Ilford, Ilford Wanderers. And it was a, an awesome experience, a totally different type of rugby than I was used to playing. So I'd say that in the States, they play probably more of a, a running game similar to kind of New Zealand, I guess. Um, and in England, especially where we were, were at was a lot of just like give it to the props and they'll, they'll move it up a meter and, and go down and they'll go up another meter with the props and then they'll give it to the backs and they leave the locks. They say, not just get out of the way. And so, yeah, I went from in the States playing in, um, you know, the first, the, or the last season before I left, I had like 20, 20 something tries that season um, <laughs> to my first season in the UK. I think I had two in the oh, wow. season. So yeah, different, totally different style of play um couldn't go for glory yeah he couldn't couldn't go for the glory <laughs> but no it was awesome and it's just yeah the, the guys that you meet there were yeah were awesome um awesome guys and yeah learned a lot and then yeah it's played there for oh three three years or so before i finally kind of just yeah was was getting tired of it and, and hung up the boots so <laughs> and- um I'd say the um the one the one thing that kind of inspired me to to do that was to go. So there's um there's an American soccer player named Jay Demerit. Have you ever heard of him? No. no. He'd be he would be an awesome guest on the podcast. But okay. um and so Leah, let me know if I can if I can put you in contact with him. But <laughs> anyway, he he was from um Chicago and he played soccer and he tried out for the MLS, so the major league soccer in the States and didn't make any of the teams. I think he made a reserve team. And then he went over to the UK and Engl- or Europe and traveled around Europe and kind of given his CV out to these clubs and looking for tryouts and yeah, just basically just didn't quit and eventually got a, a lucky break with some little Sunday or not really Sunday league, probably a, um, a very lower division team, you know, uh, like a, a little tryout and they did played well. And then I think he moved up to another team and they played against like a preseason game against Watford, who I think was in the championship then. Yeah, and got a really impressed the the coaches at Wadford, and then um, yeah, got a got a trial for them, and ended up becoming the captain. Huh. And 
Um, yeah, sco- like scored the winning goal to bring him up to the Premiership one season. No um, yeah, and, the, and then uh, ended up being the captain for the U.S. team um, in what? the World Cup in South Africa. Yeah, so no way. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, that was that was Crazy um, story. yeah. So yeah, and then, yeah. So they um, so so I met him a few times, and he he put out a documentary when I was over there. And you might have, um, do you remember when I, so I did a lot of the fundraise, I did a lot of fundraising in London for it. And I did like a Kickstarter campaign for the, to get the, the documentary released. And um, yeah, so I, yeah, basically sold tickets to this, this um, premiere in London and yeah, had, uh, had a bunch of, had just a bunch of people come and watch it and stuff. Um, yeah, but just an awesome story about, um, it's called Rise and Shine, uh, the Jay Demerit story. So yeah. Cool. I think he actually does a podcast as well too. He just started one, but um, yeah, maybe you guys could yeah, for sure. interview him. Thank he, you, man. he would be definitely um, an awesome, awesome person. Cause like I said, his story motivated me to, you know, to, to go over to the UK to play. I was like, oh, might as well just, like I said, try it and see what yeah. happens. You can always come home. That's kind for of, sure. a, yeah, that's super, it, but it's super cool. But um, I actually probably saw him play actually. Cause I went to, I went to go watch the USA play Ghana in um, oh, yeah. in South Africa. So I've, I've, I've that's the one they won. Did they win yeah, yeah, one? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I remember, yeah, they they, play, they played um, England and they they drew with England one one. And that day, like I uh, I wore my US US top to school to work in that day. <laughs> so I remember, like this is like East London, you know, Cockney Cockney. Central. Oh no! <laughs> one of the guys I work was like, "You can't wear that out there." Like to go pick up the kids outside, and I was like, "Oh, it'll be fine." So uh, yeah. classic, bud. Cool man. And so, bud, talking about like meeting people and that, you obviously had you know quite a serendipitous meeting with your now wife Paula. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Only, yeah. Tell us a little bit how so you So I was me. actually I was actually out a uh out of out one night with a few of the, the boys from the Wimbledon Hawks, the old Aussie rules team, and um we were at a place in Clapham, Clapham Comma, Clapham Junction, I forget now, called the White House, um, which I don't think is still around anymore. But yeah, she was on a hen's night from her her good friend and um yeah, we just got got to to meet. I forget actually how now. It's probably a few a few drinks involved and a bit fuzzy, but yeah, now just, uh, yeah, we kind of hit it off and, and that was, that was that, but it came out the really funny cause her, her good friend from New Zealand here who was living in London as well, who's married to, um, Tim, who, who, who Gareth and I played Aussie rules with. Um, so Paul had actually been to some of the Wimbledon Hawks like events that, that they put on, um, yeah, like the ladies day and things like that, which was, um, yeah, pretty, pretty small world considering, you know, wow. all the people in London and, and stuff like that to, to know the same people and, and been to, and then Aussie rules, not like it's a rugby club or anything, you know, like how many, <laughs> what are the chances, man? Do you what know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So pretty slim. Fate, fate, I say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so cool, man. <laughs> and, and what were you doing for work? Like in the UK? Um, uh, so I was teaching, the right. teaching there and um, yeah. So, uh, oh, did I, did I mention that? So yeah. So my, my last 14 years, I've been nearly 15 years now I've been um, teaching primary school. So yeah, I was, was teaching over there as well. So, um, and also doing the acting stuff when I could. You know, ah, so you're combining the th- those three exactly and and but you you've got a really cool story i think it was your first trip to new zealand you and you and paula went i don't know how long you'd been dating but you went there and uh you did some research about what was uh, going on there with gold and that's where your life kind of you know obviously is now and things kicked off hey mm, yep it is um and i i, I think we talked about this uh, years ago, Gareth was just kind of, I, n- I was never hundred percent happy teaching. And I was like, I know there's something else out there. It's just finding it. And so we were, yeah, Paul and I were together a couple of years and we made a trip to New Zealand one Christmas, um, for, I think we were there about three or four weeks. Um, and I knew that this area was a huge, um, was huge in like gold back in like the, the 1800s during the gold rush and stuff. And, so I, so I had it set in my mind that I was going to, that I was going to go gold panning and, and find enough to, to make my wedding ring. And yeah, so I told her dad and he was just kind of like, okay, yeah, we can go. And, uh, 
we went to a few local spots and didn't find anything and yeah went to a few other spots and finally found this little little creek um where we find a little had a little bit of luck finding some things and uh yeah just uh we spent probably geez probably a total of maybe yeah 30 40 hours <laughs> gold panning, you know like over over the course of the three weeks and um i was i was looking to get about oh i can't remember exactly what the number was i needed but i think it was about 15 to 20 grams for the ring i wanted um and i think i found about one or two maybe one yeah less than less than two so yeah <laughs> so it was uh pretty un unlucky that way but um but i ended up do i did have it uh made into my into my wedding ring so that's actually how i got into into jewelry making was uh had the jeweler that that was making the ring and just was kind of curious about what he did and and i knew he taught at a university in london uh jewelry making so i asked him you know what's what went on with the course and stuff and he said oh well you could do the course but you know they might have maybe you know five minutes of one-on-one -on -one time per per course you know session um because of all the other students he goes or i do kind of tutoring one-on-one -on -one, you know at my kind of studio and stuff um, on Saturdays, if you want to do that for a few hours, I was like, oh yeah, that sounds cool. So yeah, started catching the train on Saturday mornings down to his place and yeah, just learned everything I knew pretty much for, um, during the classes I took from for yeah the next year or so after that. Hmm, that's wow. so cool, man. That's pretty full on. And yeah. I mean, it must have been, it must have stimulated something in you when you were gold, when you were panning there and it must have still be, even though you didn't get a lot of gold, it must have even the little twinkles that you did get of gold must have been pretty, must have been like kind of exciting. And there's a kind oh, it of is. Yeah. associated. Like they, like they say when you, um, oh, you like the gold fever, you know, it's yeah. definitely true. You get a little bit of gold and you just go like, <laughs> oh, it might be worth, you know, a cent and, uh, <laughs> for the little bit. But yeah, you're like, you see a little sparkle in it. Yeah, it pumps you up and it keeps you going. And, and not only that, but I hadn't really spent much time with my father-in-law. Like they had been over to London to visit us. Um, the kind of the summer before for a couple of weeks but yeah so I th it was just good kind of bonding time as well yeah. during that time because just kind of him and i out there that is the cool. cold freezing creeks you know mm -hmm. freezing cold feet and stuff so yeah no, it was, it, that was probably the most important part was just the the bonding rather than cool. actually finding the 30 dollars gold that we <laughs> that we and found being in nature and just yeah exactly oh just stuff, yeah, yeah just beautiful beautiful area and stuff yeah and so you were doing it for, i mean every saturday it's pretty full on and um how, how was that experience was it i mean was it i mean obviously pretty invaluable i'd imagine but did you enjoy the process of learning everything yeah the it's it started off a bit slow it started off with a lot of just monotonous sawing um filing and you know pretty boring stuff and mm. And um, I, was, I remember thinking, I was like, oh, I just want to make some rings or something, you know. <laughs> the first thing I, um, the first thing I made, I think I'd, I'd mentioned this some, some other time, but I made like this. It was a, a copper brooch of a cat, you know, <laughs> just a cat. Just a, so basically, it was, so it was, you know, a, a cat sitting. It has like kind of rounded shapes, the tail and stuff. And so it's just the practice of using the little piercing saw to, you know, the the saw along the lines and and cut it out and then file the edges down and oh it's just I, th I thought it was really boring and after the first couple of weeks i was like well oh, i'm not gonna keep doing this, this is so <laughs> lame, you know? but but in the end you know it's it's the small little things that like i use those techniques every single time i make a piece of jewelry now so yeah. there was a method in his ways you know of teaching and stuff and and once we got past that then it yeah really really um yeah kind of got more exciting every time I learn something new. Yeah, I think those I think fundamentals that, are important, aren't they? Yeah, mm. exactly. But it's 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 those things like it's those boring moments. I think where where lots of people end up giving up, and they're like, "Oh, this is not for me," and then yep. they never get to experience the the true like essence of what it is to carry on and finish something. Um, yep. You're right. Which, uh, yeah. It's actually super interesting because I was listening to this podcast, these two really interesting guys on Rich Roll the other day, and uh, they've just written a book about passion and like what passion actually is. And one of the interesting things which stood out is they, they said like a passion is not necessarily something you always, that you're interested in or that you like. It's actually sort of cultivated over time. So, mm. you know, so I guess even maybe in your 
instance, like, you know, you weren't necessarily really interested in jewelry making, but you started doing it. Then you went to these, these courses and you didn't necessarily like it, but you started to enjoy it later on. So finding your passion, sometimes you need to start to things you don't even like or know that you like. Exactly. And, and a lot of the techniques um, that I do now, uh, with the carving of wax um, to be cast into into rings or necklaces or different things, you know, it started off way back in high school with with art and sculpting and and mm. um, you know pottery and clay, working in clay and things like that. So very similar stuff. And like I said, yeah, building up over those years, even though I had a huge break in between there. So yeah, who knows what if I would have yeah stuck with something like that, what it would have been, you know, may have came into came in you know a lot earlier in my life, but. Yeah, it's it's been it's been a pretty good journey so far. Um, with yeah, the, that and and like I said before, like it was it was finding that um, finding that something you know that that I knew that I was looking for, I guess. Mm. Yeah, for sure, bud, for sure, man. And then so so you decided like you eventually left uh, the UK and you went back to or you went to New Zealand and you you first went to Christchurch, is that right? That's and, right. Yeah. So uh, yeah. so it was five and a half years ago. Um, oh, I'm probably closer to six years ago now. Um, we found out Paula was pregnant. Um, so it was, uh, we were just kind of deciding on where we were going to go. Um, initially, before we were, before we found out she was pregnant, we were looking at moving to the States um, mm. around like LA or something like that. And I was actually looking into a job with um, the LAPD. Mm. So um, being a police officer was, was a, like a, that's what I wanted to be as a kid. You know, that was like my childhood kind of dream job. Um, and yeah, just, uh, I forget what it was, but I saw something and, and was thinking, Oh, maybe, maybe now's the time was to, 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 you know, to go back and look back into that, that kind of profession. And, uh, then we found out Paula was pregnant and the way the health system is in the States, the healthcare, um, and not having a job there prior to moving, and going to have a baby there you need insurance or else you'd be paying for everything yourself and mm -hmm. it's not cheap to mm -hmm. to do that in the states and then we found out that it was twins so then we were like oh yeah no, uh, <laughs> so definitely don't want to be like pushing pushing a, a, a double pram around the tube or riding on buses and things in london yeah uh, we didn't have a car or anything and um, and so yeah we decided that the best move was to head back to New Zealand. And basically we had about six weeks before now nah, it was a little longer than that, probably about eight weeks, I guess. Yes. Yeah, a couple of months. We only had a couple of months to basically make the move before Paula got, you know, too, too, um, too far along to fly. So, wow. Yeah. That was a, a stressful Appreciate couple of months. It. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's how we, that's how we um, ended up leaving New Zealand. I mean, sorry, leaving London and, and we, we stopped in Christchurch. Um, along the way and that's where we stayed just because uh, my brother-in-law lives there with his family we had lots of friends from london living there as well and we didn't want to move straight from you know london a massive city to little old cromwell of <laughs> five thousand five thousand people um so yeah so christchurch was a was a good stop that just you know a couple years prior had two massive earthquakes that basically just leveled the city so there's a lot of rebuilding and stuff and it took a little while for me to uh, get my teaching qualifications all assessed and everything. So, uh, yeah, so I, uh, my wife's cousin had a friend that was a builder that had just gone out on his own and needed some, needed some work workers. So yeah, started working with him as a, as a hammer hand. So, yeah, <laughs> cool. That was, that was pretty good. Yeah. Just, um, going from teaching kind of full-time teaching to full-time kind of building just a totally different totally different type of profession and like basically when you're teaching and you and you, if the bell rings at three o'clock you still have about three or four hours more um hours of work left in the day before you can kind of clock out really um whereas in building as soon as 4 30 hit bang you're done you don't have to think about <laughs> building or anything and just like the like I was physically a little more tired, but because, you know, I wasn't really too bothered by it. But after a day of teaching, you'd be like just exhausted, just, you mm -hmm. know, falling asleep on the couch, just mentally tired. So yeah, totally. It was a, it was, it was a good little, um, good little break um, from teaching. 
That's awesome, awesome. bud. Yeah, you're giving so much energy, aren't you? And you're teaching and you're just giving, giving, giving. And mm. I guess. Well, you just never switched off, really. You just yeah. always, you know, you always, you got, you know, might have 30 kids that you're kind of constantly on the go, keeping, keep an eye on. And um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's very mentally taxing, I guess, compared to physically, I guess. So Alex, yo, I've actually got a few mates that are um, builders and stuff um, and from Australia, but also from Christchurch. And um, they were saying what a, well, they, a few things. So first of all, like what a, like a boom it was into after the earthquake for, for building industry, you know, like they were just, there was so much work and now it's sort of plateauing a little bit, but also like what a um, sort of a trendy city it's become almost through this tragedy. They've created like a, a new city um, mm-hmm. with a new feeling and a new vibe. So that's kind of a cool side effect of, of a horrible event. Hey? Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, just the amount of amount of change and like you said they got they got a, a, a second chance to kind of revive the city and yeah it's a really really fun place to to go back to now to visit um and uh yeah so good stuff mm-hmm. yeah i remember, <laughs> I remember going to, i remember going to sorry, yeah, i remember <laughs> going to to christchurch actually did you ever meet, meet steph alex uh as uh, aussie rules guy Mm-hmm. No, he didn't. No, no. But I just remember going there and like the, the whole town. Wow. The whole center of the town was like shut off. And, um, you know, after you, were, you were there right, oh, right after the earthquake then. Yeah. Not too long after. Yeah. yeah and it was like yeah. quite like eerie in a way, you know, this like yeah. whole city is just, you know, no, completely blocked off and people weren't in there anymore allowed to go there. So mm-hmm. yeah. Crazy. Crazy. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and man. so so Alex, you ended up moving to Cromwell, and then sort of the, uh, as you say earlier, so sort of the outskirts of Cromwell, uh, and you started to sell your jewelry in a in a sort of a small local market, but it didn't actually go amazingly in the beginning, did it? No, 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 no. So um, so down in Queenstown, so I'm like I said, I've I live in a small little town, Cromwell, which is about forty minutes from Queenstown, which is kind of the adventure sports capital capital of um all oh, the world they say but yeah who knows mm-hmm. um but yeah so they had uh, uh, a little kind of farmer's market um that i first had a stall in um a couple of times so the when they first signed up to do the market they said oh we'd really like you to commit to three markets so i said okay sounds good i'll do that and um the first the first time i did the market I sold a decent amount. It wasn't my greatest market ever that I'd done. Um, and the second time was just kind of a little bit less. And then the third market was really bad. It, uh, I didn't even make enough to cover the, you know, the cost of the stall at the market. So hmm. I was a bit uh, discouraged from that. But um, luckily, there's another market in town that's kind of further further in town right on the waterfront on the on the lake wakatipu and it's an arts and crafts market um so everything that is sold there has to be sold by the person who makes it so you can't have um yeah kind of that's other, cool. pe- other people's things or imported stuff to sell um whereas the other market you could sell other people's stuff and it was kind of more of a farmer's market for locals where the market the the one um the second one is a huge like tourist market so yeah. every week thousands of tourists kind of come through there which makes it um yeah really good because you get new kind of customers every every week so um that was probably uh, it was probably three years ago i started doing that and yeah it's, it's been really good yeah i've been um yeah really lucky with kind of the people i've met you know i love like selling to customers you know like that rather than i do like the online sales of course but um you know it's just just being able to meet customers face to face and tell them my story and and hear their story and 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 uh yeah being able to to give them a piece of jewelry that they can take home and and enjoy forever really Mm. yeah it's it's so cool like yeah like you know there's more meaning when you can actually tell your story and hear their story and stuff and you know, there's that, that connection. So whenever I guess they think of that piece of jewelry, they're like, Oh yeah, this is from Alex, you know, American guy I met and blah, blah. And, and it's really cool. But so, but, but it must've been tough selling the jewelry, working a full-time job, 
you've got, I don't know at this point, was it like, you obviously got the twins, but you know, you've also got a, an, another daughter now. So like, how did you juggle all of that? Um, it was tough really. Um, so I was, yeah, I was teaching full time and, um, yeah, with the kids, basically I would work on things when they went to bed. So instead of sitting and watching TV, I'd go out to my workshop and, and work for, you know, a few hours a night. And then Saturdays was basically like another work day and then we'd go to the market, spend all day at the market. Um, and then, yeah, have Sundays off to, to relax and, and spend time with the, the kids and the family and stuff. So yeah, I've got the twins, the twins and then, um, a son bow. Yeah. A son. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, man. I don't know why I thought you had three, three girls. <laughs> Yeah, so lucky. Like, yeah, get a boy. side hustle going there. Wow. Yeah, so yeah, a little um yeah, my little jewelry side hustle. So um yeah, it's been going 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 well for well, I started in 2012, but um it's really kind of taken off since I've been been in Queenstown doing the markets. Um and a lot of word of mouth and and online stuff too. So yeah, it all it all helps to kind of build up the business. Mm. So yeah, it's awesome. Uh, it, it, and, it's, and maybe sorry yeah go yeah. no i was just gonna say like it's it's really like inspiring actually like you know just just seeing people work that extra bit harder and you know putting in hours sacrificing stuff and being disciplined to to do something that they're really passionate about um mm. well, so yeah me. yeah no it really is but like i uh, i think you know, lots of people want to do things and talk about it, but actually never end up doing it. Um, yeah. You know, and it's it's just really inspiring. Have you always had that kind of fire in you to do that? Or be like that? Uh, yeah, I did. I always, I yeah, I have, but it's always been a thing with me is um, of not knowing what. And also, I think I have, um, what's the, is it like the, the impersonator syndrome or something like that yeah yeah, of course imposter yeah yeah, imposter yeah yeah. well i've always felt i think a little bit like that too is like oh why would they you know this isn't good enough nobody's gonna buy this or you know i'm not good enough to do that and and yeah so i even like when you asked me to be on the podcast i've kind of felt like that i was like oh that'd be awesome but why does he want me on there you know that sort of no way wow yeah yeah (laughs) so so, you know thanks for saying those those kind things but uh yeah, it, it always has been a, a thing on the back of my mind that I wanted to do something like that, but just, I don't know if it was um, because of not knowing what or just maybe being a little scared as well, or maybe a bit of both, who knows? Yeah, yeah. And, and did you have this idea at that st- at sort of this stage where you were having like this full-time job and jewelry, did you know, like, hey, I actually want to ramp that up and reduce this, the teaching? Did you already kind of know that or... Yeah, the uh, well, the initial goal was um, so when I when I was teaching in London, I was really over teaching, and that's why I said when I went to Christchurch that it was good to have that year break from teaching. Um, just I was really burnt out, and that was kind of my goal was to be able to do the jewelry stuff full time, and it was a big step to be able to do that um, from where I was at in London, um, and then from doing that then in Christchurch and then in Queenstown, it kind of made it, there's a bit of light at the end of the tunnel saying, Oh yeah, maybe this, maybe it will be a possibility mm-hmm. one day to not teach and just do the, just do my, you know, jewelry and, and that kind of stuff uh, full time. And then at work, they kind of asked me what I, what I was interested in doing there. Cause I was kind of a classroom teacher, but also teaching the PE and I was a sports coordinator for the school and it was, it was pretty full on. And, and they'd asked me, you know, what would be your ideal thing? And I said, Oh, ideally I just want to do the sports and PE. Mm. And then they came back and said, well, you know, we have this available. Um, you can just do the PE and, and the sports coordinating and, but it's only three days a week. And I kind of looked and I kind of thought, you know, like, mm. oh, oh, how are we going to pull, how are we going to pull this off? You know, it's not good. And then kind of the more I thought about it was like, damn, this is, this is what I want, you know, like this is ideal. So, so that's what I've been doing the last three years now is um, so teaching three days a week and then yeah, having the rest of the time off. So I will do kind of a bit of kind of casual teaching if they need me on those extra days, if they need, but that's you know, not too often. 
and the rest of the time I can, I can work on the jewelry and, and the things that go with that, you know, just the, you know, the marketing and, and um, yeah, advertising and, and all the little things, social media stuff that goes, goes along with it besides just making stuff. So, yeah, so that's, that's where we're at now. And, but, the, but I'm perfectly happy with that. Like I'm, I'm loving my job now, you know, my teaching part of it, like in this, this P, doing teaching the PE and um, the sports coordinating, like setting up the, the school sporting events um, mm-hmm. that we have. So yeah. where it goes in the future from, from there, then yeah, maybe it goes full time, but yeah, I'm pretty happy with kind of where, where it's at now. Ooh, yeah. um, but I would, like I said, I would, I do want to build the business more and more. And with that, then maybe it does come less and less teaching because mm-hmm. um, I, all the stuff I make, I make it personally. Like I don't have someone else making it and then I, I send it off, you know, so I make each piece individually. So the more, the more I orders I, that come in, that's just, you know, more hours that I need to put in to, to make it. So yeah, exactly. I guess if, if I'm getting, uh, if I'm getting hundreds of orders uh, a week, then the, the teaching isn't really going to be able to, to be able to happen. But yeah, until we get to that point, it's, it's good where it is. Yeah. Nice. But the, 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 I think, you know, there's quite a cool, you know, couple of important lessons. There. Like the, everything takes time, but it takes longer than we want. And, you know, and that's just a huge lesson that we've learned as well on the podcast. And I think people need to always remember in general when they're starting something like, you know, you have to grind it out. Like it's not going to be easy and and it will take time, but as long as you are consistent and you're doing good things, it probably will uh, be successful in the long run, but it just takes time. And sometimes that time is two, three, four, five years and and you just got to keep at it. And eventually you'll look back and you'll go, okay, cool. That was worth it. Um, Mm. Yeah, yeah, you're hundred hundred percent correct. Like a lot of people want things instantly and they don't want to work for it. Mm. And yeah, just lots of lots most things. I guess every somebody gets lucky with, you know, hitting a lottery yeah. or something. But um yeah, most of the time it takes a lot of hustling. A lot yeah. of hustling. And like you said, grinding and grinding and grinding until one day you hit that tipping point and boom, you you made it. Yeah. So, for sure. Yeah. And there's and it, something cool yeah. actually about doing um both in a way i actually kind of dig that you know like just having that variety in your life and if you're in the workshop all day every day you you miss a bit of the human interaction and Mm. you know so there's well i mean you've got the you would still have the markets but i guess there's something um nice about um spreading the uh, your time over the two and and having a good balance you know Mm. yeah no that's that's what i think i enjoy too because like i I don't want to get burnt out on making jewelry, you know, like being in my man cave for 13 hours a day kind of thing. And, and just nonstop just in there by myself. And yeah. so, yeah, no, you're right. The, the interactions that I have kind of daily with, with, you know, people and, and the kids I teach and things is it's all, yeah, it all kind of as a, as a good balance. Mm. That. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But, and, but maybe you can just tell us like a, a little bit about the jewelry making, like you have some cool things you, you add, like you said, everything is personalized and some of the cool things you do is put on coordinates of where people live and then oh, yeah. badges and stuff. So maybe you just want to tell us a little bit about the, the stuff. Yeah. So, um, a lot of the things I do for the market or, um, you know, they're kind of New Zealand related. Um, but a lot of my, most of my, most of my stuff is kind of outdoors and, you know, kind of nature inspired. Cool. and uh just a bit more rustic-y so it's nothing that you'd find in like you know jewelry um, high street jewelry store or anything like that really it's kind of yeah a bit more um organic i guess is a good word for it um but yeah so like you're saying that the coordinate stuff so i've done uh necklaces and rings for people that have kind of a, a special locations coordinates on it so for example like uh um Oh geez, uh, the hospital where their where their kids were born, or the spot that they were proposed to, or the spot where they had like their first kiss or their first house that they grew up in. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Like on even on you know just a I forget the exact website, but there's there's plenty of them where you can pinpoint the GPS location of a of the exact spot. So hmm. basically, I take that take that GPS location number and then. Um, yeah stamp it with little kind of um they're just like 
little metal steel stamps you individually just hammer hammer onto the onto the silver mostly i do stuff in, in bronze uh copper golds brass as well but yeah mainly silver is the biggest one and um yeah so rings rings and necklaces are, are huge like that so yeah a lot of a lot of custom orders for for those types of things and then um i've done quite a few uh family crest kind of pieces um for example like a recent one i did was my wife um her aunt got in touch with me and she wanted something for her sons that had both her last name and her husband's last name you know because they're they're sons are actually you know they're a mix of both of them so she wanted both of them on there so look she was she asked me what i could do so we had to look at their both their um kind of their family crests one was a, a lion and the other one was i forget what that picture was but it had kind of two vertical arrows on on either side of it so yeah i took the the arrows um from the from the one and placed it on um either side of the, the lion just in Photoshop and then was able to then get a wax seal stamp made um, with that, with that image. And then, so what I do is I carve the ring out of wax and then heat it up and then make the impression with this, with this custom wax seal. Um, and then you take that wax and you cast it um, mm -hmm. into the, into the, the precious metal that you, you use. So in this case it was silver, but, um, you can do it in, in, in any go any metal really gold or hmm. yeah, like I said, the, the bronze and stuff, but, uh, yeah, silver, silver and that. And then, yeah. So then you're, you've got your kind of custom custom ring with the exact same kind of, uh, family crest that, that I, uh, made the stamp into. So the, the, that's just that, that method is called the uh, lost wax casting. Hmm. And so it's really, really neat because anything that you do into the wax when you make the mold of it and when you kind of then pour the molten silver or metal or whatever you use into the mold you have exactly the same you know impressions that were in the wax so if you have a little scratch in the wax then that shows up in the final final um final piece so yeah, you can get a lot of really fine detail and things which makes it yeah, really cool so yeah another really really cool rings pretty been pretty popular so far so that was actually um an idea i had was to do a kickstarter campaign but really just with those types of rings um and yeah i haven't done it yet but yeah that was that's an idea i have in the in the works huh. to, to kind of help get those get those out um to people so sure. awesome but oh, it's so like, something, technical yeah <laughs> there's something so like it harks back to some kind of a the olden days or something it just mm. sounds so cool hearing you speak about it like you working with your hands cr creating art um, but from like metals and things from the earth you know there's just yeah. something i don't know really it must be almost therapeutic when you're working with this stuff yeah yeah it is and um i think like i did enjoy building like i said when i when i talked about working with a builder but just took so long to see a final or like a uh, you know a finished house or whatever we're working on whereas like a piece of jewelry you know you i could knock something out in a couple of hours and have a finished piece you know whereas the process of those rings that i was just talking about they take a few weeks because you know it's a process of um, getting the the wax seal stamp made up and things so um, but yeah I think with the patience level for me and, and being able to see something you know from in a couple of hours from just a yeah piece of, of metal into a, a finished piece of jewelry is is pretty cool mm. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, yeah well, I actually just wanted to ask one more thing about the your crafty and your creative side was you actually have made like some candles as well like <laughs> man candles I, yeah, I kind of so, that's a cool idea you just briefly just tell us what, what those are yeah so i um i wanted to expand my brand more into kind of um some more men's kind of gifts and things mm -hmm. i think especially in new zealand there's not a huge huge um kind of market for oh well, i think there's a market but there's not a huge um i guess options i guess to choose from if you're looking for kind of gifts unique gifts for guys and stuff so yeah so i'd um yeah came up with these 
different scents for um, I call them man cave mandals. So like a man candle, <laughs> so a manly, manly smelling candle. Um, so the first one I ever did was a bacon scented one and that uses, uh, that used actually like um, bacon, bacon fat from after I cooked my bacon and um, drained it off and <laughs> put it in the fridge. And then, um, yeah, it was once I uh, made a candle out of it, um, and yeah, you got a candle that when you burn it, it smells like cooking bacon. In your house, so. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. That's really um, good. A few other, um, a few other scents I have. Um, one is whiskey and cherry tobacco, kind of mm. like cherry smoking tobacco. Um, one of my favorites is uh, one I call dirt and orange, which is kind of a patchouli and um, orange scent. Um, the patchouli has like a, you have kind of a, like a soil, um, earth aroma to it. So yeah, no, it smells really nice. Um, a barbershop one that smells like the, the old fashioned barbershops, the talcum powder and, and hmm. stuff. Uh, oh, leather, all oh, leather baseball mitts. Another one. That's a really <laughs> nice one. It smells yeah, like a, you know, like your old, <laughs> old so baseball cool. gloves when you're a kid. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's just a little project that I've that I've started up, and I also do um, beard oils as well. Um, nice. So yeah, making making beard oils to kind of uh, sweet moisten well, the, uh, the man cave moisturizer beards. Nice, man, we need some pampering too, maybe. I just yeah, wish yeah, exactly. you a beard like yours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Alex, just moving a little bit on um, to sort of one of the more sort of tough times in your life. Um, and actually, it's one of your twins, Grace, was um, diagnosed with a brain tumor in 2017, which is obviously incredibly tragic and, mm-hmm. and just a super horrible thing to have happened to anyone. Yep. Can you maybe just speak a little bit uh, about that, please? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah, it was uh, May 2017, um, just about three days before mother's day. So I can't remember. I think it was the 11th or so I think back now, but um, yeah, we noticed grace was walking like her knee was hyperextended. So kind of, kind of click back when she was walking and then we kind of looked at her and I saw, I noticed it the weekend before and I was just kind of like asking, I was like, grace, what, why are you walking like that? You know, like, what are you doing? Just walk normal thinking that she was just kind of goofing around because that's the way she is. And um, yeah, she, and she didn't stop and it kept up like that for a few days. And so we got her into the doctor. The doctor said, uh, oh, it's probably just a, you know, an infection or something. She'll be fine, you know, and, and we left. And that next night, about three in the morning or so, one of Paula's, um, Paula's good friends, uh, called us well, was trolls trying to get a hold of us and um grace had actually came into our room and then paula saw all the missed calls i was like oh started getting a bit nervous what was going on and it, her her friend had actually sent the video of grace walking to her sister-in-law so her friends her friend sent it then to her sister-in-law who's a um pediatric neurologist i think it is over in brisbane and she got a hold of Kelly, who's Paula's friend, and said, look, I think she should go down to the hospital and, and get it checked out right away. You know, it's not, I don't think it's just an infection like the, yeah. the GP had said. And so, yeah, we went, they, they will, we called uh, my father-in-law in the middle of the night, so 3, 3.30 in the morning, come over. He came over and picked up Grace and Paula and went down to the Maiden, which is where the, the closest, you know, big hospital is, about three hours away. And um, yeah, they were there all night into the morning. Um, got into an MRI kind of four, three, four o'clock the next afternoon. And then Paula called, um, called me and I was back at home, you know, with the kids all day, just waiting. And, um, yeah, called me about seven o'clock that night and said, you know, Grace has a brain tumor. And I remember it was just like an out of body of experience. It was just, yeah. Jesus. I, yeah. I remember, it was in my, I, was in, I remember exactly what happened. I remember what I did. I was in the bedroom and I just kind of was just like shouting, no, you know, or just, you know, just, I think that's just the first thing that came out. And, you know, like Paula was awesome on the phone. Like she wasn't crying or anything um, then. And uh, yeah. And I was just in, in full shock and basically, yeah, 
she put me on the phone with the doctor and yeah, the prognosis wasn't good at all. And mm-hmm. yeah, he was like, I think you need to get down here right away. So the next morning, yeah, took the trip down there. And, um, and I mentioned like to Gareth that with the whole journey with grace, there's been so many like signs and this, this day, the drive down there was so like rainy and miserable and come like out of like the mountains and into like the clearing. And so there's nothing on the radio through the mountains and stuff. And we come to the clearing and on like my friend's radio who we're riding with, like the sun, the sun comes out. And when the radio starts playing, it's a sublime song on the radio. No so way. Like, yeah. So it was like just a, a crazy, wow. you know, like when you, when you have stuff that's happened, there's been so many kind of coincidences that they're not actually coincidences coincidence yeah. you know anymore there's just been so many um so yeah so anyway carrying on with that um the, the doctor kind of um when we met with him he he talked to us and he said look we don't know we have to, we'll have to get a biopsy and find out what's going on with it and um but he goes oh but he goes you know from the looks of it it's you know pretty symmetrical um you know, it could be, it could be a slow growing thing. And I immediately said, yeah, that's what it is. And he just kind of looked at me like, mm, don't get your hopes up, buddy. You know, like mm. to, to, to talk to Paula and my father-in-law later, they were basically, they were basically had no hope for her at all. You know, mm. they were just like, they said the looks of like sympathy from the nurses and the doctors and like the anesthetist was crying and stuff. No way. So, um, yeah. So, I missed all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I, from the, from the get go, I had like a positive mindset that things were going to be okay. And that was no other options, you know? So we flew up to Auckland then a couple of the, uh, the next day, actually, um, she had a biopsy, the surgeon then who was the top, one of the top surgeon brain surgeons in New Zealand, he had a meeting with us and he said, look, from what I've seen, it looks good. Meaning that is be the, you know, a, a slow growing tumor. And so, um, yeah, they, and it has a cyst attached to it. And the cyst was actually what was pressing on the nerves that were causing her to walk like that. Um, so they drained the cysts while they're in there. And then, um, yeah, we stayed in Ronald McDonald house in, in Auckland for a few days. And then we were back down to, um, back down home and my mom flew in from the States. We had a couple of weeks and they said they were going to call us up and let us know what the results were in, in a couple of weeks. So we said, okay. So we had a couple of weeks go by and they call us and they say, we want you to fly up to Christchurch for this meeting. So we're just like, what the fuck? You know, like what the yeah. hell? Why can't they just tell us? So that's when we really thought the worst. Um, and those two days, probably between that call and the time that we had the meeting were the worst by far because we just, oh. yeah, we just thought the absolute worst. Trying to keep a positive mindset was really tough. Then you actually, yeah, you think about stuff that, that you never want to, kind of go through you know um but yeah so we um flew up there then and we had the meeting and yeah the guy is going on and on and on he's explaining about tumors and how they can be a one or a four four is the worst one's the you know the what you look for is being benign and slow growing and he goes and graces and i'm thinking he's gonna say like a four and he goes and graces is a one and it was like oh jesus you know they're like and they're like, and like, we were like, kind of like happy. And they just kind of looked at us with stone faces. Like you're happy, wow. you know, but considering the alternative, yeah, it was pretty yeah. good. Um, so we, yeah, we, after that, we came home. Uh, and a few days later, then Grace kind of went downhill and they said, uh, yep, we're going to airlift you up to Christchurch. And then we were in Christchurch. Um, yeah, she's in Christchurch later that day. Um, so this is, I get, so this is beginning of June, 2017. So over three weeks, this has all happened. And then, um, yeah, they had another surgery where they put in a, um, like a shunt and they put in like a drain in the, in the cyst that would keep it continually draining if it needed to, to her stomach. Um, and then, yeah, she had, uh, 12 months of chemo. And so while the, also over the six months we were up in, um, up in Christchurch, we stayed at the Ronald McDonald House in Christchurch, um, at, which is right next to the hospital. Because of the distance, we were at home from the closest hospital hospital in case we needed to get there. And um, yeah, just the the experience we had there was just amazing. Like the Ronald McDonald House, the 
you know, is one charity that we are eternally grateful for, you know, and we do anything we can to kind of help them with anything they need, you know, with fundraisers and, you know, if we go, they want us to go do a speech, you know, at a fundraiser, then we've, we've done that a few times, you know, collected donations from companies for them, you know, and things like that. So we can, we do whatever we can to help. Another one is the child cancer foundation. So they paid for a lot of, um, they, they support, they're kind of like the cancer society for, you know, adult cancer, but it's for kids. And so they paid for a lot of um, flights for like my father-in-law to fly up to visit us and help us in Christchurch or um, petrol vouchers to go down to Dunedin um, after we came home from Christchurch to go down to treatments. So yeah, they just, and they do like family camps that we did. We went to like a family camp all together in October last year. Yeah. They do a, like a dad's, a dad's camp, um, a mom's kind of getaway weekend and things like that. So yeah, just two really great um, charities that we, that we really try to, to help as much as we can. So yeah, that's, that's kind of where we, where we're at. Grace is doing really well now. Every MRI that she's had um, has showed that the tumor is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So she, her last one was in right before Christmas. So six months after her um, last treatment of chemo and it showed that it was still shrinking. So that was pretty, pretty awesome. Considering the doctors, when we first started, the treatment said, you know, just keeping it stable is a win, you know, if it shrinks and that's a, that's a huge plus. Wow. Um, so yeah, so they're, they were quite happy with the results and yeah, so we just, it's just really six monthly MRIs and, and yeah, that's where we're at now. And she's doing, doing awesome. All the symptoms have like gone away. So she's back walking perfectly fine and stuff. Um, now they started school in February, the twins did. So yeah, they're loving school and, and doing great. So yeah, there's actually, um, so when we talked about Lewis Howes before, Lewis Howes has um, a guest on there quite regularly called um, Chris Lee. Can't tell if that's backwards or not. For okay, your, um, yeah, yeah, spring. I can see it, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so this guy, Chris Lee, and I actually messaged Lewis after we found out about Grace, and I said, look, is there any of your guests, the people that you've met, you know, in this, on your podcast kind of thing that you'd be able to you know, give me names of that I can contact. So I was, you know, wanted to try anything I could to, you know, well, anything to, to help. And he said, look, Chris Lee, I'd get a hold of him for kind of yourself and that kind of support, you know, like kind of emotional and mental support for yourself. And then another guy um, who wrote the Bulletproof Diet, um, Dave, ooh, uh, Dave uh, that's it. Yep. Yeah. So I said, and him, he's, the, he's done a lot of stuff like that. And so I've listened to, few of his podcasts on um yeah like brain tumors and like the ketogenic diet and stuff um which has been really good results but a really crazy thing happened so i messaged chris lee um just like after i heard from lewis and during grace's second surgery in christchurch we basically so we stayed at the ronald mcdonald house i took her up we dropped her off for the surgery and we came back to wait and so this is like three weeks later and I hadn't heard anything back from this guy, Chris Lee. And then after dropping her off on the way, I get a message from him. Mm -hmm. No way. So like right at that time, right after she got in for the second surgery, wow. he said, Oh, look, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm took so long to get back to you. You know, I've, I, had, I didn't see the message. I think it was on Twitter or something that I sent him the message. And he said, I haven't seen it. And he gave me all these kind of tips and things. And I took that as, yeah, like one sign that was, yeah, you know, just like of all the times from the message back was right after she got has gone into this brain surgery, you know, that's <laughs> wow. is, um, right when we needed it the most, really. And then nothing crazy happened. So in that surgery, my um, my grandma died. Like I found out my grandma died. Like no yeah, while she was in that surgery too. No um, and I think my my grandma she had fallen a couple weeks before and wasn't doing well. Um, but I think, yeah, I don't, I don't know what it is or, or, or how it is, but I, I think there is some type of, it probably sounds weird, but some type of kind of changeover between my grandma passing away and her kind of sticking around long enough to, to pass over, you know, mm. in, and look after grace during this surgery, you mm. know, like the, um, just the, the timing of it, you know, it's crazy. So yeah, yeah, no, it was just uh, quite a few little experiences like that that we felt. Another one, another crazy one was um, right before we 
got the call up for this meeting. I was in the shop and I um, was in the shop with bookshop with my mom when she was visiting. I saw this book. So it was, um, so the secret, have you heard the secret? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So this is uh, this is like, this is like people's stories from the secret. Mm. And so we were in the, we we're in the, just the, the store and I pop it open and I turned it straight open in the, in the shop to a, a story about a, um, a tumor in this person's dog. So it was a little bit different than uh, your kid, but I guess some people are pets with their kids, but it was basically how this person secreted. So they kind of used the, you know, the, the positive affirmations mm. that this dog's tumor was going to be benign. And, you know, it's pretty much the same exact thing happened like with grace, like it ended up being benign and yeah, it's just so crazy that I found this book. And then just a few days before we get that call to come up and I just straight up opened the book up. Wow. And the first story was that one on, you know, this dog's tumor that was benign as well. So wow. yeah, just a, a few little, a few little crazy stories. And there's, there's actually a few more. And I think I mentioned that I want to want to write a book, just getting them all down. Even if, even if only, th only just to, kind of document it, you know, yeah. for Grace later on to, to read yeah, when she's man. older. That's so, yeah, so that was, um, that's, that's been our last couple of year journey. Um, yeah, it's been, not, it's not easy, is it, bud? Nah, man, nah, it's been, um, like you, you, like I've taught literally probably thousands of kids and never have had a kid, luckily, you know, with anything like this. And then when it happens to your own, your kid and you're just like, what, yeah. you know, like, why us? Why me? You know, mm. but, and like I said, but we do, we've done everything we can to, to try to keep as positive as we can. You know, we've met quite a few families that have not had the same, you know, positive, um, positive outcomes as us. So yeah, we're just so grateful that, oh, so grateful that, you know, that, that our story goes this way. Mm. For sure, bud. Cheers to you, man. Thank you for sharing that with us, man. Oh, you're welcome. No, yeah. Um, yeah, hopefully if, it, if anybody listens that it, that it helps and yeah, that's awesome. So For hopefully, sure. it, hopefully it would. Mm. I actually had a friend, um, like good mates of mine. Like we were, you know, went to high school together and always have just been great mates and, uh, they had the same thing with their son that happened, um, last year they found a tumor in his, um, in his, in his brain too. And, um, it was also, I mean, just you know, tragic for them over a, a long period, you know, like at least, I don't know, six, six, seven months of not really knowing what's going on. And, and yep. fortunately, well, they had an operation and removed it. And fortunately he got the all clear, like literally oh, awesome. two, three weeks ago. Oh, that's but, so good. Yeah, yeah. So good. But yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, we must, we really, it's such a lesson to treasure life and to treasure our relationships more than anything. Hey. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah. No, it's taught us that like the little things don't matter at all, you know? And even now, yeah. sometimes we kind of forget that again and you're kind of like, what am I doing? You know, like, why am I, why am I telling the kids off or throwing their food on the floor or something? It's like, who cares? Who gives yeah. a shit really? Totally, you know? Man. So, oh, but that's awesome. Glad that, um, glad that outcome was, was positive for your friends, friends, yeah. um, child yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks man. Um, so, so yeah, but look, uh, it's, uh, been an amazing time talking with you. Um, we, uh, just treasure everything and like, we love these, uh, love these conversations and, you know, we could talk for hours with you and, and sadly there was a couple of technical glitches on my <laughs> side. So that ate since okay. our time a little bit, I'm so sorry, but thanks for being so understanding, but nah, you know, okay, before, you know. before we finish off, um, uh, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about like what the future holds for Gold Pan Pete, um, uh, where people can contact you, and then uh, Craig will ask you our final question of the day, which is a great one. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess my goals are just to keep building my business and and one day uh, one day be full time doing doing that passion project that I've that I've been kind of just having as a side hustle the last few years. Um, yeah, my, my website is uh, goldpanpeat.com um, and has the story about how that actually name came available. A little bit kind of the gold panning, how I uh, did here in New Zealand. Um, Pete, just a random person that 
gold pen Alex didn't sound right. So <laughs> I made up, um, but, uh, yeah, no, either, either on my websites, um, or, um, Instagram, I use Instagram probably the most out of all the social media platforms and it's just at gold pan Pete on there as well. So yeah, Perfect. I'd love to love to hear from people that, that listen. Awesome. My man. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to definitely make links, uh, to all of that and to your website and, and all of that, because yeah, I think it's a great work that you're doing. No, but uh, so as Gareth mentioned, the last question we'd like to ask everyone is, is an important one to us. And I think you, you certainly understand a lot about this, but um, what does being ridiculously human mean to you, Alex? Um, being ridiculously human. I think it just means to just go after anything that's out there. You only have one life to live, you know, just, just don't make, don't have any regrets. Um, take my mom's advice. You can always come home. You can always, um, go back to where you were before, but sometimes those, those, uh, opportunities that you have aren't there forever. So yeah, just take advantage of the things you have in front of you. Don't look, yeah, don't look any other way. Just go for it. I love it. Great advice, but great advice from your mom there. And it just got it actually yeah, yeah. so true though, isn't it? Like if yeah. you throw everything at something that you really want to do and it just goes completely the wrong way and doesn't work out. If you're fortunate enough, you just go home and you go, mom, I need to come and stay yeah. home again for a few months <laughs> or whatever long it is. Get the couch, get the couch. Worst case scenario. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Um, Cool, man. But look, I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's it's been so cool just to to hear more of your story, you know. And it's it was interesting when you said like that, you know, you you have I guess a bit of the imposter syndrome, and and a lot of us do. But um, the the one thing that this podcast teaches us is that every single one of us has a, a great story, um, and I think we kind of forget about it sometimes. And you do have a great story, but like, you know, you've, you've done so many things and, and I'm sure you're going to inspire other people to just venture out and go do things too. As uh, so, mm, I hope so, yeah. Yeah. So it's just like, it's inspired me to kind of like now make, you know, I've been having a, I've got a couple of decisions that I'm kind of, you know, umming and ahhing about, but now like just after this chat, you just hit it home again. You just got to do it. You know, you mm. just got to do it. Stop messing around, stop wasting your time. So yeah. Thanks so much for sharing the story, but thanks for being so honest about everything um, and, you know, just uh, being raw about certain things too. It's, I think it's really, really an important part of um, teaching other people lessons is just to be super open and honest. So uh, you're a flippin' great man. I've okay. always enjoyed our time together. I've felt connected to the instant I met you in that um, Aussie rules huddle. <laughs> and I look forward to definitely, um, yeah, definitely coming and seeing you in person, but because you live in a great part of the world and it'll just be great to connect and come pick some cherries and stuff with you there in Cromwell on the farm. So thanks, my man. I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, thank you guys for, for having me. Um, yeah, it, mean, it means a lot to be able to, yeah, come on and, and share with you guys and talk to you guys. And yeah, the same way. It's been been a long time since we got to the chat, so it's been really good. But I also want to just say, you know, thanks to you as well, because, I mean, we had these chats, I remember back in London about, you know, just not being fulfilled with our jobs and, and, and things like that. So yeah, it's awesome. I just want to give props to you to, you know, that you've gone out and, and done the same thing as well, you know, like following your following your passions and stuff and uh yeah no it's really cool to see so I'm, yeah proud of you for that thanks man. Yeah, make, thanks and, man. Uh, yeah it's awesome, <laughs> awesome to chat with you craig too so yeah, you're closer so yeah come on anytime you guys are flying into queenstown or anything um yeah let me know you guys always got a place to, weeks, eh? place that's, to that's, the, that's the thing eh? yeah <laughs> well <laughs> i got this little hut now that um it's like a little like uh like a little cabin outside so you can you can you stay too long out of in the outhouse out of yeah no, it's not an outhouse it's actually like a little bedroom but um, yeah so it's out of the house but no 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 you're, you're more than welcome anytime epic i definitely are, so. definitely when we come down check it out and i haven't yeah, sure, i haven't I snowboarded for since i've lived in Oz, which is almost three years now so um that's kind of the closest well not the closest but one of the most decent places that's close by so yeah i'm happy happy there. to take you so yeah thank you man anytime. and i just want to just add just real briefly my, my thanks from my side but um 
Gareth said it really well. Um, you know, everyone has an, a story to tell that's worth listening to. And, uh, you know, so many people are like, like so many, I think are in the same situation you're in or that have a side hustle and are working on it. Like for example, me, I've, I've cut my working hours down to like three, three and a half days now as well. Mm. And, um, and so I'm like a very similar situation to you. And so your story talks directly to me. So there's an example of like why it's so important to think, okay, cool. Like you've totally given me like how many ideas about what you're doing and the, and the, like how you got there and, and why you're doing it. And, and, and so, you know, I'm just one out of, I'm sure lots and lots of people that feel the same way. So it just always remember that like when you, when you are telling your story, it's a very meaningful story and, uh, and it's a, and yeah, told with real honesty and, and that's something that comes through in, in the chat. So um, just from our side, you know, thanks for that. And, uh, and thanks for spending your time with us today. It's been an epic uh, conversation. No, it has I look forward really, to seeing you down there. Yeah. I really, really enjoy it. So yeah, thanks again to you guys. And, and also like, um, yeah, if, if anybody else who's in a, in a side hustle or anything like that, that, that I can give some advice to if they have any questions about anything, yeah, feel free to get in touch with me at those, um, yeah, on the website or Instagram as well, even if you're not interested in the jewelry or the baking candles or anything. But uh, yeah, just um, want some, some tips or advice or anything like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. feel free to get in touch. I'll be, I'll be happy to, to share my knowledge of, uh, of that sort of stuff. But yeah, no, no, it's been an epic chat and it's been, it's been really good. Thanks guys. Cool, man. Cool, man. Wow. That's Thanks, awesome, buddy. bud. Thanks for man. And cool, man. Um, thank you so much. For you yeah, but thanks so much, man. And sorry for those little that works, yeah. which is that's all good. <laughs> what was up there. But anyway, that's what happens sometimes as part of the podcast world and podcasting. No, so, um, no problem, bud. So yeah, man. And look, uh, I think we might actually put in a couple orders. I think it would be cool to, Maybe get Craig. What do you want? Like a ridiculously human ring and stuff. Right, I'm, I'm <laughs> flipping in, mate. I'm yeah, in yeah, for yeah. an RH ring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'll I'll chat to you. Going like to the states soon, and then don't don't people yeah. wear like a NFL like the, yeah. I just remember watching uh, Ace Ventura, and you know, the, <laughs> like I want a freaking ring. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's only ten o'clock, so I still got a few hours of work time to go. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that you're a machine, buddy. man. Well done, like you. Yeah. It's amazing. So <laughs> okay, cool, yeah, yeah, you take care, man. And we'll be all in touch with you next week uh, with the launch and, and all that sort of stuff. Okay. For sure. Okay. Sounds all good. Buddy. Thanks again. Cool. Yeah, no worries. On, See man. you guys. You take care, See you, bud. See you, Adios. Bye. See you, man. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Adios. Bye. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy cape fall.